racial segregation in housing was not merely a project of Southerners in the former slaveholding Confederacy. It was a nationwide project of the federal government in the 20th century, designed and implemented by its most liberal leaders. Our system of official segregation was not the result of a single law that consigned African Americans to designated neighborhoods. Rather, scores of racially explicit laws, regulations, and government practices combined to create a nationwide system of urban ghettos surrounded by white suburbs. Private discrimination also played a role, but it would have been considerably less effective had it not been embraced and reinforced by government. Half a century ago, the truth of de jure segregation was well known, but since then we have suppressed our historical memory and soothed ourselves into believing that it all happened by accident or by misguided private prejudice. Popularized by Supreme Court majorities from the 1970s to the present, the de facto segregation myth has now been adopted by conventional opinion, liberal and conservative alike. A turning point came when civil rights groups sued to desegregate Detroit's public schools. Recognizing that you couldn't desegregate schools if there were few white children in Detroit, the plaintiffs argued that a remedy had to include the white suburbs as well as the heavily African-American city. In 1974, by a 5-4 to four vote, the Supreme Court disagreed. The majority reasoned that because government policy in the suburbs had not segregated Detroit schools, the suburbs couldn't be included in a remedy. Justice Potter Stewart explained that black students were concentrated in the city, not spread throughout Detroit suburbs, because of unknown and perhaps unknowable factors, such as in-migration, birth rates, economic changes, or cumulative acts of private racial fears. He concluded, The Constitution simply does not allow federal courts to attempt to change that situation unless and until it is shown that the state or its political subdivisions have contributed to cause the situation to exist. No record has been made in this case showing that the racial composition of the Detroit school population or that residential patterns within Detroit and in the surrounding areas were in any significant measure caused by governmental activity. Most disturbing about Justice Stewart's observation was that the civil rights plaintiffs did offer evidence to prove that residential patterns within Detroit and in the surrounding areas were in significant measure caused by government activity. Although the trial judge agreed with this argument, Justice Stewart and his colleagues chose to ignore it, denying that such evidence even existed. From this evidence, Federal District Court Judge Stephen J. Roth, in his opinion that was overruled by the Supreme Court, concluded, the policies pursued by both government and private persons and agencies have a continuing and present effect upon the complexion of the community. As we know, the choice of a residence is a relatively infrequent affair. For many years, FHA and VA openly advised and advocated the maintenance of harmonious neighborhoods, i.e. racially and economically harmonious. The conditions created continue. Judge Roth urged that to acknowledge that other factors were also involved, we need not minimize the effect of the actions of federal, state, and local governmental officers and agencies and the actions of loaning institutions and real estate firms in the establishment and maintenance of segregated residential patterns which led to school segregation.